and also very pleased to be joined by um, Kayla Montgomery, who is the executive director of Planned Parenthood in Northern New England. And on to help us answer questions is Dahlia Vadunas, who is the executive director of the Equality Health Center, as well as Sandy Danancor, who is the executive director of the Lovering Health Center. Thank you both for being willing to um, be part of this conversation this morning. Um, you know, I never thought I would see in New Hampshire, in the live free or die state, the action that we have seen from the executive council and the legislature to attack women's reproductive health. Um, what we saw last week was an executive council that um, made decisions about access for women to health care um, because most of the clinics that they have defunded um, provide significant health care coverage for women in the state, for thousands of women who get their cancer screenings, their mammograms, um, do sexually transmitted disease testing and treatment. And all of that now is going to be at risk because of the actions of the executive council. And, and let's be very clear, this is not about abortion. There is no public funding that goes to abortion. So for all of those people who claim this is an effort to reduce abortions, that's just wrong. Um, this is about providing health care for women and families who really need it, and most of them don't have any other options to get their health care. And sadly, what we're seeing now is that this decision means that um, for many of those women and families, they're going to have difficulties getting the care that they need. And, and you know, um, one, as I'm sure all of the reporters on this call know, one of the clinics that was defunded doesn't even provide abortion care in any capacity. And so the vote, the three to two vote to defund that clinic either was based on grandstanding or it was based on a failure of those executive counselors to do their homework and understand what they were voting for. And it's truly disappointing. And it, it really needs to end. As I've said before, if we were talking about access to care for men in the state, this would not be an issue. And we know that the in order for families to thrive, um, they need access to this care. So we have, uh, we also have a legislature that passed a budget that puts at risk um, access to reproductive health for women that would ban abortions after 24 weeks, that would require an ultrasound for women and require that they pay for it. So even though that's not a necessary requirement as most healthcare providers will tell you, um, it's something that the legislature has decided all women in New Hampshire will be faced with. And what we've seen from the governor is an unwillingness to take on this issue and his um, suggestion that he doesn't support the actions of the executive council just don't ring true because he has been willing to allow these actions to happen despite the fact that he could do a much better job of addressing this. So this is not a pro-choice governor. This is not even a pro-woman governor. And it's disappointing to see that. So again, the threats to Roe v. Wade and reproductive health are very real. Uh, the impact on women, as we'll hear from our uh, clinic directors is very real and we need to do everything we can to reverse it. That's what we're going to be working on in Washington. The delegation has asked the Secretary of Health and Human Services if there is some support that we could get to help our clinics in New Hampshire get through this next few months, which are going to be a very difficult time for them. And we will continue to work on that and do everything we can to try and address the funding challenges that they're facing. So again, thank you all for joining us. I will now turn it over to Senator Hassan.
Maggie. Well, thank, thank you so much, Senator Shaheen. Um, I want to thank you and uh, my colleagues in the House, as well as the healthcare providers who are participating today for your participation and uh, for your advocacy and care for the women of New Hampshire and uh, Northern New England. No matter where they live and no matter their economic status, Granite Staters deserve access to comprehensive preventive health care and family planning services that will enable them to stay healthy and thrive. Frankly, I don't see how you can argue against that. Yet there are politicians in Concord who are threatening life-saving health care for Granite Staters. They're using New Hampshire to make a political point, and we cannot and we should not let that stand. For those in rural communities, for low-income women and men, and for members of the LBTQ community, family planning centers, including Planned Parenthood, are a major source of vital, high-quality care, including for things like cancer screenings, birth control, HIV and STI tests, and counseling services. That's why the Executive Council's decision to discriminate against these providers and block vital investments in healthcare is so dangerous and so wrong. The vote last week was an outrageous vote that threatens to take away services that so many people depend on. And it will have a disproportionate effect on low-income Granite State families and those who already struggle to access care. Making matters even worse, the Executive Council is stripping away resources for health care as we continue to grapple with a global pandemic. So rather than listening to public health experts, New Hampshire's Republican Party is yet again playing really shameless political games with women's lives, just as they did this summer when they passed a partisan state budget that included an extreme abortion ban that limits a woman's freedom to make her own health care decisions. Women across our state deserve better. We have had in the past a bipartisan history in New Hampshire of protecting a woman's constitutional right to make her own health care decisions and protecting a woman's access to health care. Uh, but the actions of the last few months in New Hampshire um, have really undermined and, and um, changed that bipartisan history. Women across our state deserve much better. They deserve to have the opportunity to make their own choices about if and when to start a family. They should be able to visit healthcare providers of their choice, a healthcare provider who understands their particular needs. Um, I'm going to continue to support women's access to reproductive health care services and fight for funding for Planned Parenthood and family planning providers in the wake of this harmful vote. And I'll work with my colleagues to do so. At the end of the day, uh, women need to be able to be fully included in our economic and civic life. And if they can't make their own health care decisions and they can't access critical health care, um, they really aren't being included uh, to their full potential. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to continue to fight and work with my colleagues to make sure access to care for all Granite Staters uh, is provided. And with that, um, I'll turn this over now to my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Costa. Thank you, Senator, and good morning. It's so great to be here with Senator Hassan and Shaheen and my House colleague, Chris Pappas, and the leaders of Planned Parenthood of New Hampshire, the Health Equity Center in Concord, and the Lovering Center. Along with Senator Shaheen, Senator Hassan, and Chris Pappas, I've always been a tireless champion for autonomy in women's health. This is what this boils down to, control over our own bodies, our own life decisions. I support universal access to family planning, and I've always stood up for women's constitutional rights here in New Hampshire to privacy and to equal protection of the law. So it was dismaying to watch the New Hampshire Executive Council vote to terminate multiple contracts for family planning services, which effectively defund critical services for women's health providers across New Hampshire. The Executive Council's dangerous decision to end these contracts for family planning services across the state is a misguided effort to strip women of their constitutional right to personal autonomy and privacy and the full reproductive health resources. So we know when women lack access to healthcare services, 
that they need, lives can be needlessly lost. The Supreme Court has had testimony that it is 11 times more likely that a pregnancy will end in death of the mother than termination of that pregnancy. Safe access to reproductive and preventative health care, including birth control, STI treatment, and cancer screening for our residents is essential. And this misguided decision by the executive council cuts off critical resources for our most vulnerable populations, including rural communities like in my district in the second CD. So please know that I will continue working to ensure that every Granite Stater has access to the full range of reproductive health care that they need. And I will combat the consequences of today's decision. You know, I was an adoption attorney for 25 years. I primarily represented birth mothers over the course of over 300 adoptions. And not once did I work with a birth mother who wanted the government Governor Sununu, the Executive Council, Republicans in the state legislature to make the most personal and private decisions about her life, about when and whether to start a family, about her autonomy. We have every meeting that I have in the district at this point in time, people are asking about the workforce issues. Well, the workforce issues relate to women being able to get back into the workforce, childcare, making personal decisions about their families. And this decision sets women back from being able to control their reproductive health. And it also impacts the men that impregnate women. We frequently talk about this as a women's issue. We rarely talk about the men. Obviously, that is a decision for men when to plan a family, whether to plan a family. And I think this is a really important issue for all Granite State voters. I'm eager to work with our congressional delegation, community partners, and our women's health advocates across the state. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Congressman Chris Pappas. Well, thank you, Annie. Thank you to you for uh, your leadership through the years, as well as Senator Shaheen and Hassan. Uh, and it's great to be with our health advocates here today as well, uh, to Kayla, Sandy, and Dahlia. Uh, it's great to see you on this. I really appreciate you adding your thoughts and your voice to this conversation, which represents thousands and thousands of patients all across the state of New Hampshire. So I wish we were together under uh, different circumstances than we are here today, but look like people across the state. I'm truly outraged that a majority on the New Hampshire Executive Council has again rejected family planning contracts. And even worse, they did so after repeated confirmations from our State Department of Health and Human Services that no family planning funds have been used for abortion care. Uh, we've seen this play out a couple times before in 2011 and uh, in 2015. And each time it has not been about what's best for women and families, but about politics. And that's really disgraceful and it's dangerous. The, the counselors who voted to defund uh, our family planning providers have refused to listen to the facts. And instead they've put their own extreme political views ahead of what's best for women and families in our state. And even worse, it's gonna be low income women and families who are most impacted by, by this decision. Uh, as someone who sat on the executive council, I've considered these contracts in the past and I know how crucial these funds are to provide basic services that have been mentioned here today, birth control, annual exams, cancer screenings, and STI testing. Um, and as with the rest of the delegation, I've been in touch with the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level. We wanna do all we can to ensure that family planning providers can continue to meet the needs of patients across our state. Um, when taken alongside the failure of the Supreme Court to stop the Texas abortion ban, as well as our state legislature's um, foray into a ban on abortion, um, I think we see that there's a full assault on the rights of women, on access to reproductive health care, and we've got to make sure that we are pushing back. Um, that's why when we return to Congress this week, I'm 
uh, eager to vote in favor of the Women's Health Protection Act. It's gonna work to codify the Roe v. Wade decision into law and to identify restrictive statutes that have been put in place in states across the country uh, to make sure that we're doing all we can to safeguard the right to choose and access to reproductive health care. Um, access to abortion and reproductive health care is clearly on the line right now as we see so many states uh, rushing uh, in sort of the absence of a, a reaction from the Supreme Court to remove that Texas statute, uh, there are going to be more and more extreme laws that are proposed in legislatures across this country. So that's why uh, this particular effort at the federal level is important to safeguard Roe. Um, and we have to do all we can to make sure that our providers can continue to offer this care uh, that women depend on across our state. So I really am um, you know, just thankful for the voices of so many folks who have been speaking out against the executive council's wrongheaded decision of last week. Um, if history repeats itself as it um, was the case after the last two defund efforts, I think we will hear loudly and clearly uh, the voices of women and constituents uh, who are really outraged by this decision. And hopefully we'll have the political courage uh, to do the right thing and restore funding um, at both at the state and federal level. So that's the work that we have ahead of us. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here for this conversation. Kayla, can you um, talk about what you're seeing in your family planning clinics? Certainly, good morning. Uh, thank you, Congressman Pappas. It's it's a real honor to be here today with you all. Thank you for having me for this really important discussion. I'm Kayla Montgomery, Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood of Northern New England here in New Hampshire. I am proud to be here today representing my colleagues at Equality Health Center of Concord and Lovering Health Center of Greenland. Planned Parenthood's five New Hampshire health centers, along with our partner health centers, see about 12,000 patients in the New Hampshire Family Planning Program, or 80% of the entire program. Last week, the New Hampshire Executive Council voted to defund our health centers, thereby dismantling the New Hampshire Family Planning Program. So I want to talk a little bit about what's at stake. Rates of unintended pregnancy and teen pregnancy in New Hampshire are among the lowest in the country. And that is in large part to the New Hampshire Family Planning Program and the work that our health centers do every single day. The services that Planned Parenthood and our sister organizations offer are critical in helping our communities be healthy and meet their reproductive and sexual health care needs. Patients covered by the Family Planning Program receive preventative sexual and reproductive health care, such as cancer screenings, birth control, STD testing and treatment. And even before the pandemic, STD rates were on the rise in New Hampshire, with syphilis and gonorrhea bring in, being an outbreak status. And research shows that COVID-19 has further interrupted STD screenings. We know that healthy communities and healthy families start with access to quality, affordable health care. Planned Parenthood of Northern New England in New Hampshire has been providing this broad range of reproductive health care services to people of all genders and ages under state family planning programs for nearly 50 years. State funding for this care is critical because it covers low income and uninsured Granite Staters who rely on us for these specific healthcare services. We are trusted providers for affordable and non judgmental reproductive health care, which is why last week's vote to defund us was particularly shameful. This defund jeopardizes care for nearly 12,000 patients and it disproportionately impacts low income and marginalized people who have been hit the hardest during this pandemic. At a time when the state should be prioritizing health equity to foster healthy communities. Yet last week, these four extreme New Hampshire executive counselors chose to ignore actual public health experts and put their own views before the health and safety of their own constituents. It is clear that they either don't understand how the New Hampshire Family Planning Program works or they don't care, but the results are the same. Armed with only misinformation, they voted against access to this critical preventative health care for thousands of Granite Staters. This vote was indicative of what we were seeing in New Hampshire and across the country, that access to safe legal abortion and the full range of reproductive health care is under attack and on the line like never before. We are tremendously grateful for Councillor Warmington, the only counselor to stand up for the health of her constituents and we're grateful for the thousands of patients and supporters who have stepped up to make their voices heard in the days following this dangerous vote. And again, to our entire federal delegation, 
for fighting tirelessly to right this wrong and working in Washington to protect access to reproductive health and rights in New Hampshire and our country. We thank you. And I'll turn it back to Sarah. Great, thank you. And with that, um, we're good to open this up to the question and answer portion. Again, thank you to Sandy and Dahlia for joining us for that portion as well. So if you wanna go ahead, members of the press, please click the raise your hand button and I'll call on you in the order that I see. I see Teddy Rosenbooth of Concord Monitors first. Teddy, why don't you go ahead? Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just wondering if this is probably a question for Kayla, if you can put the impact of the executive council's vote into some tangible terms, um, like are people gonna see longer wait times? Are you going to be turning you know, people away who are, are seeking this care? Um, if you can just give us some concrete examples of, of what the impact might be. Sure, and I certainly invite anyone to jump in on this, but um, you know, this is, this defunding is serious. This is a um, this is a very important piece of our funding, and this is only um, this compounds issues around COVID as well. Um, and the problem is that these issues continue to compound, and, and we're going to see impacts on our um, for our patients. Uh, our doors stay open. I want to be very clear about that. Our doors stay open, but we will see we possibly will see things like cuts in services or longer patient wait times. Um, and I welcome Sandy or Dahlia to add to that. Um, I agree. We're definitely going to be seeing longer patient wait times. We're also going to have to take a relook at our sliding fee scale. Right now, our sliding fee scale is at 250% poverty level. And that's the safety net for the people who aren't eligible for the expanded Medicaid at 137% poverty level, but are working two jobs, not full-time, can't get health care. Those kinds of things are going to really affect our low-income patients. Services such as our, we have an STD special when the state in its wisdom decided to defund STD testing at one point. We are able to provide STD testing, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HIV testing for $95 for people who are underinsured or uninsured. It costs us $92 for the tests. We do not charge for staff time. All of that goes away. Those are the kinds of things that you're going to see happen from now on. People aren't going to be able to afford services that don't have insurance or who have that $5,000 deductible or that $10,000 deductible. If I could jump in with a quick follow-up question. Sure, but then we'll have to move on, move on after okay. that. Um, when might we start to see these impacts? For us, it's immediate. We're actually working right now to we look at all of our sliding fee scales. That's what we're doing this week. So it will be immediate. Thank you. Great. And next, we'd like to go to uh, Anne Marie Timmons with the New Hampshire Bulletin. Anne Marie, go ahead. Okay, we can come back to you, Anne Marie. I'm going to go ahead to Kevin Landrigan with the Union Leader. Yeah, hi. I wonder if folks could talk about the likelihood of the Biden administration front fronting some money as the delegation had asked for, and also just give an update on the status of the Trump gag rule and how that's changing and when for these uh, family planning programs. And Senator Shaheen, do you want to lead us off there? Yes, I spoke with Secretary uh, Becerra from Health and Human Services last week uh, about this and several other things. And one of the things we talked about was whether there are any um, funds that are flexible enough to be able to come in. So he said they are going to explore that and see what they might be able to find. One of the challenges is that some of those funds that are available that could be used are still under the the global gag or the gag rule that was put in place under the Trump administration, um, and they're in the process of changing those rules and, of course, um, providing appropriate the new appropriations process. But the challenge is catching up with the needs that our clinics have, and so the gap is gonna be really problematic and that's what we're trying to fill. And we're gonna to continue to do everything we can. Um, and 
uh, we've, the administration is willing to help with that. The question is what funding is available that we, we can access. And I don't know if any other members of the delegation have had any conversations or would like to respond on what you've heard. Just well, maybe I'll just, oh, go ahead, Annie. I'm sorry, we just, I had a similar conversation with Secretary Becerra when he was here um, in state and it's a catch 22 because they have to go through a rulemaking this fall, I think it was October to lift the gag rule. And so it's a timing issue as to whether they can get funds here quickly enough. And so we're working on this gap that Senator referenced. Yeah, that's consistent with my conversation as well with the department last week. And I would expect we'll hear something uh, imminently about um, you know, the lifting of the gag rule and what the process is going forward, not just for our providers here, but um, for many other providers across the country that have been impacted by uh, harmful political decisions uh, that have undermined the family planning program over the last several years. Um, but I think this is a, a real unique emergency situation here in New Hampshire. Um, so we'll continue um, to leave no stone unturned to make sure that our providers are getting the help that they need. I would just add the other issue was explaining to the secretary and his team about the role of the executive council with federal funds coming to the state. And I think that's part of the catch 22. We need a workaround where we can get funds directly to our healthcare providers that don't get caught up in the political antics of the uh, extreme far right executive counselors. Well, that's right, um, Annie, because what we saw also is that they've refused to accept federal dollars to um, address COVID as well, which is very distressing given the pandemic. Well, and you mentioned, Senator, but it's pretty weak of the governor to let the decision happen four to one and then say, oh, I disagree with it. The same with him signing the you know, literally it's on his hands that physicians and healthcare providers could go to jail. And he's tries to say he couldn't do anything about it in the budget. He signed the budget. He clearly could have sent it back and said, I'm not going to sign that budget. And so I think part of what we need to convey to our constituents is who's really fighting for their uh, rights, their constitutional rights for their health care during a pandemic, and, and who's standing on the sidelines not getting the job done for them. And people should call the governor's office and express their frustration and concern about what's happened. Those people who can't get access to care now because of what's going to be happening at our family planning clinics should let their legislator, their executive counselor, and the governor know about their frustration and what the impact of that is and how harmful it is. And those people who don't want sexually transmitted diseases spreading in our community. I mean, I'm proud of the fact that we have such a low uh, teen pregnancy rate. That's long, hard work from going back to the days when Senator Shaheen was governor, when Senator Hassan was governor. We've worked very hard knowing the impact on people's lives of teen pregnancy and how devastating that can be uh, for young women. You know, I do a lot in the field of sexual violence and um, we have a long history in this state of, uh, of people um, being impregnated against their will, whether it was incest, whether it was uh, sexual assault. And we have worked very, very hard to make sure that people are protected, that they can protect themselves even at a young age. Thank you. And next, I know, Anne-Marie, you had some technical difficulties, but I believe you've resolved them. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, for Senator Hassan, Senator Shaheen, I wondered, uh, you've been in that governor's seat working with an executive council. What do you think Governor Sununu could have done that maybe he didn't do to make this vote go differently? And given that the four votes seem unlikely to change, how do you see this shaping up as an election, election issue? Thank you. You know, obviously the 
executive council doesn't always agree with the governor. Um, I know that Maggie can speak to that as well. But the fact is, as Kayla pointed out, for over 50 years, there has been support in mostly Republican administrations in New Hampshire for funding for our family planning clinics. So the, the governor could have made a very strong statement at the outset. He could, have he could have held on to those contracts for a while. He could be looking for other ways for the state to help provide funding for the family planning clinics. That's what happened um, several years ago when the legislature provided funding because of challenges that they were having. Um, and yet he's done none of those things. He issued a, a statement that tried to distance himself from the action of the executive council, but it's just not credible. I, I would just add, uh, you know, what I said in my remarks, the bipartisan history um, of support for um, access to health care for women and for reproductive care in particular um, has been, you know, just uh, clearly abandoned by this uh, executive council and the Republican Party from top to bottom in this state. Um, and, you know, Governor Sununu also made a similar vote to defund Planned Parenthood um, when he was on the executive council. So um, this is really an issue for the Republican Party uh, in New Hampshire, top to bottom. Great, thank you. And we have time for one last question. If there are any other questions out there, again, if you want to raise your hand, if there are any more, if there's any last question. Kevin, I see yours is up. Is that from before? I just want to make sure. Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Well, that will conclude uh, our press conference this morning. Thank you all again so much for joining us. If you have any follow up with uh, any members of the delegation, please reach out to me for Senator Shaheen, for Laura, for Senator Hassan, Jennifer, for Congresswoman Custer, and Colin for Congressman Pappas. But thank you all again very much. And thank you so much to the providers, to Kayla and D Dahlia and Don Sandy for being on with us as well this morning. Really appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Take care.